everyone. This is the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast. Thanks for being with us. To everyone who listens regularly, as well as those who are here for your first episode, welcome. We are glad you're here. And one of our goals is to create a community and space where everyone feels at home. So one way we do that is we produce this podcast ourselves so that you can listen without interruptions. Right. And for that reason, we only show up on charts based on reviews. So we would love it if you feel so inclined to leave a review about whatever you may be loving about this podcast or what you would like to hear us discuss. Your review also gives context to others who may not have heard of Crazy Amazing Humans and may benefit from knowing us. That is true. So Jefferson, if I were to say to you the phrase, badass nun, what comes to mind? <laughs> hmm, give me a second. Uh, you, well, okay. Uh, there is a caricature, of course, we've all seen of the nun, stern, dressed in black with a big, you know, uh, <laughs> ruler. wooden ruler <laughs> wrapping your knuckles. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, yes, that is, um, I will say, I, I, I did start in Catholic school. So I, that is something that we always were afraid of. But that is possibly what some people might think. But thankfully, our guest today is not that. Not she, that. Not that, no. But she is a badass nun in all the good ways. So our guest is Sister Rose Picotti from the Pauline Center for Media Studies. And if you watch movies, TV, or really any kind of media, she will open your eyes to some surprising insights, not only about why you might like what you like, but what might be some of the underlying themes that you may not be aware of. So important. So as you know, Crazy Amazing Humans community, we are always looking to bring you the most uplifting and inspiring stories and practical information. And Sister Rose brings it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so take us on your morning drive, won't you, or your morning walk, because you're going to get something out of this conversation, I promise. Also, make sure to click to subscribe to our podcast, join our email list, and check out our website at crazyamazinghumans.com so we can all stay in touch. Yes, I do. We do like to do that and we will. And we love this community and we want to thank you so much for joining us on our mission to inspire, encourage, and be a positive influence in the world. And this is when we remind you that you, you are freaking crazy, crazy amazing, amazing, you badass, badass people. people. I want you to Today's episode of the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast is brought to you via Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. All episodes are free, so make sure and subscribe today. Hey, everyone. We're here with Sister Rose Picotti, a lecturer, author, and media literacy expert. Sister Rose is a member of the Daughters of St. Paul and founded the Pauline Center for Media Studies in Los Angeles. She is a well-regarded film reviewer and a tomato meter approved critic on the popular website Rotten Tomatoes. She is an award-winning film journalist and author or co-author of 15 titles on film, film, and scripture and media literacy education. Oh, but wait, there's more. Yes, there is. <laughs> a world traveler, Sister Rose gives presentations and courses on media literacy around the globe. She has a BA in liberal arts with a concentration in communications, a master of education in media studies from the University of London. Oh, pip, pip, and all that. <laughs> and a certificate in pastoral communication from the University of Dayton. In addition, she earned a doctorate of ministry in pastoral communications in 2018. Obviously, she is a lifelong learner. Yes. <laughs> uh, Sister Rose also writes the blog Sister Rose at the Movies on the Pathios website. So, Sister Rose, welcome to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast. Welcome. Thank you. It's so great to have you here. And it seems like it was only a matter of time before we could get together because we have some mutual connections that are fun. You reviewed my husband's film, The Heart of Nuba, my husband's Ken Carlson, and that featured our very first podcast guest, Tom Katina, Dr. Tom Katina. And we also had a wonderful conversation with our mutual friend, Bonnie Abanza, on our Crazy Amazing Humans podcast. So you've been on our radar for a while and it's just meant to be, we're glad you're here. 
there. And it's just not every day that people get to talk to a nun and one of your order, Daughters of St. Paul. You all are known as the media nuns, and that's very intriguing. So we are kind of want to know for our audience and ourselves, what does that mean? Well, it means that our community, our congregation was founded in 1915 in Italy, at first to use books to spread God's word and God's love everywhere. And then as new means came became available, we took on those means. Of course, cinema was invented in 1895. We didn't get into it until 1938, but it happened on the Feast of the Epiphany that we just passed on January 6th. So we just wow. passed this big anniversary of being involved in cinema. We used to produce a lot in Italy, especially, but now we're, we're do, taking a more educational and reflective approach towards cinema. Amazing. Yeah, so that's just, that's cinema where we have radio stations. Of course, we have internet radio now too. And we were online everywhere on either social media or the daughters of St. Paul dot, uh, dot org or dot com website and be media mindful dot org is one that I participate in. And it's so we use media to promote God's love and God's word around the world. And well, to try to bring I, people together. Right. And I, I also read a little bit about being you all bringing um, calling your calling to be somewhat like bringing light in the darkness, which can sometimes happen in the media world. And so, oh, yeah, you all do that. So that that's a wonderful thing. One time our founder, Blessed James Alberione, said it's better to turn on lights than to complain about the darkness. And then Father James Kelleher, a Mary Knoll priest who founded the Christophers, he said he always had that saying, it's that's better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. Beautiful. I remember that, I like that. that it was in a Peanuts cartoon. I remember seeing that. Yeah, quote. very probably. Oh, my been. gosh. And by the way, so what I got to say is what's cool about what you guys have done is you've started out, you know, with books, as you said, and then as other media presented itself, you've adapted mm -hmm. And I know you continue to do so. I'm so glad that in the words of the comedian Jim Gaffigan, <laughs> that you, you went from Italy or Italian to speaking English, the, the language that Jesus spoke. <laughs> so I'm so happy we made that transition. The Italians so, <laughs> think that Jesus spoke Italian. Yes. So uh, <laughs> then they've got a beef with Jim Gaffigan is all I got to say. <laughs> Sister Rose, let's talk about uh, your calling, how you became involved with, you know, not only integrating your faith or maybe even how you uh, originally thought of taking your faith and then applying to this. How does this calling that you have specifically serve humanity, do you think? If you go back to the calling, when you feel this impulse, and of course I was raised Catholic, and even though I didn't go to Catholic school, you know, nuns were always in the periphery. And there was a movie that came out the year before I entered called The Trouble with Angels. And that was really very influential in, in my discernment process that I was going through. And, you know, it was the 60s. You know, the Vietnam War was escalating tremendously. There was the Up With People movement. Do you remember that? Where people were trying to do some good in this world. And there were all the riots going on and the civil rights movement. And there was the shooting at Kent University. All of these all these things, this upheaval in humanity. And you just go, well, what does it all mean? Where can I, what life does God want me to choose that doesn't really change, but yet, can grow. And that's when I talked to my mom and my mom put me in touch with this lady at church. And she put me in touch with the sisters who were in San Diego at the time, which is where I grew up. Even though she took me around to other communities, the daughters of St. Paul really spoke to me, even though I didn't really understand completely the work that they did. It was their joy and their personality that just, I just said, oh, I can do this. You know, I could be happy with this group of nuns. But what does it mean to be a sister to dedicate yourself to God? You know, you're not, you don't have uh, children, you don't have a family, but you're fruitful in other ways. Hopefully by, we use the, um, the media to tell stories, to promote God's word, and to hope that that little spark of grace will be connected through that inspiration. We don't always know the good that we do. Our founder used to say that. 
But I'll tell you this little story. I was in South Africa in our bookstore in Johannesburg. And I was just, I was visiting there. I was doing some presentations and I was just wandering around and I was in front of the spirituality and psychology part. And one of our sisters had wrote a book on depression and she had had a stroke at the age of 21. She had surgery and it blew through a blood clot. So she at 21, she had a stroke. So here she is 25 years later reflecting on it. She wrote this book on depression. And this woman came up to me and she said, are you American? And I said, yes. And she said, I live in the outback. I'm really in a rural area. And someone sent me this book on surviving depression. That's the name of it. And do you know the sister who wrote this? And I said, yes, I do. And she said, would you tell her for me that it saved my life? Oh, and I went, wow. wow, that is a moment mm -hmm. when maybe it's not my book, but it's our community together, right? That had something to do. And to hear somebody tell me that was just so moving. Absolutely. And you all started this Pauline Center for Media Studies, right? right? And so for our audience, what is media literacy and why is it important? Ah, very good. I think. Yeah. And what difference can it make to, in people's lives? I think that's yes. the other thing. Yes. So media literacy is the, it's this life skill and uh, it is the ability to access analyze, evaluate, reflect on, and act in regard to our consumption and our relationship with media, entertainment, or information media in whatever way we get it. And what it means is, you know, when you, when you choose something to watch or play or engage in, that you choose it mindfully. You know, something you like, well, ask yourself, why do you like it? You know, what is it about it that is it helping me be a better person? There's all kinds of questions that you can ask yourself. For me, when you're watching a story or engaging in a story, consuming a story, because you know we're consumers of media, what does it mean? We saw the Tender Bar on Netflix a couple of nights ago. What does that mean? It means family. And that family, even if they're not perfect, they're flawed, they're they can be tender towards one another. This kind of, it's about a bartender, but the name of the movie is The Tender Bar because of the influence he had on his nephew and who, who was, didn't have a father, you know, or father was remote, shall we say. What, what a beautiful, beautiful, simple film. And, but what does it mean? Well, it means that family is important. That's mm. what I think it means. And that, we need to care about how we are in relation to the younger members in our family, you know, who are just just learning about us, but we're creating mm -hmm. bonds and memories that can last a lifetime. So that, but then you can get into other movies or TV shows. Uh, uh, you watch the news at night. We often pray the news, you know, we will watch it during a time of prayer. And then afterwards, we, whatever spoke to us more strongly could have been a natural disaster. It could have been political upheaval, or it could have been maybe health. Healthcare is again at the top of the agenda that's going on. So we pray for that people have access to healthcare. Why? Because it's a human right to have access to healthcare. So these, this is how we are concerned with humanity. Media literacy is an invitation to participate in life. It means to get in there and talk about it and maybe act on it in some way. I love everything that you're telling us. It's almost like it reminds me of the quote by Socrates, the unexamined life is not worth living. Every bit of media, it seems, is going to have some effect on us. There is always some kind of point of view, agenda, if you will. And Absolutely. If you're not, and if you're not media literate, it's just going to have its way with you. And you might be open to manipulation, right? Because well, you're not aware of how it's coming at you. So, right. Do you all teach, you know, kind of ways to discern? Sure. And I love the word you use, discernment. That is the most beautiful word because you're looking at something, you're weighing it, you're evaluating it, you're choosing. So, Media, there's a couple of ways that I can just explain here. There's four questions that you can ask, like, what's going on? What are they trying to convey to me? What's going on here? What's really going on? Like underneath, well, 
these are people who are trying to do some good in the world and to tell, share some good stories and let you meet some amazing, crazy human beings, right? Does it make a difference? Do, does this make a difference in my world, in the world out there? Well, that's, that's a value, you know, a response, right? You're evaluating, does it make a difference by my watching this? How can I make a difference? And, you know, when I teach media literacy to teachers and parents, that's like their biggest wailing complaint. What do you want me to do, Sister Rose? What, what are we supposed to do? Tell me. What, mm-hmm. No, it's, it's up to you to decide how and to reflect and discern. How will you take what you consume today, heard today, and and go out and make a difference in your own life and in the lives of others. Will it give you a voice? Because participating in the cultural discourse of the world is so important today. And if we don't participate, we kind of don't exist, mm. right? You know what I love about that? Can I just interject really quick? The, mm-hmm. uh, the idea of uh, a dialogue with the media. We're not, you know, it's, uh, when I was a kid, the big complaint was, oh, there are a bunch of couch potatoes, right? Uh, They're just sitting there passively sucking it in. And what I love about what you're suggesting is that, no, we have now, now that we are aware of or intentional about looking at what this means, what does this require of me? How do I then participate in the world, knowing now what I know, seeing what I'm seeing? Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Exactly. And It's also speaking to the storytellers of tomorrow because they're in our pews, our classrooms, their bedrooms and living rooms today. Mm -hmm. So if they understand how media works, how media tell stories and how to and they care about humanity because we hope that they're getting good character education and learning empathy from a very young age so that their stories that they tell will also go on to turn lights on in the world, to make a difference. That's that's how you can put media literacy into effect is because we're all content creators. If we're on social media, if we're doing anything uh, in this way, we now have power that others didn't have. You know, our nuns in Boston, our younger sisters, younger sisters have made nine TikTok videos and I, you can go on there and do Daughters of St. Paul TikTok and you'll get the page. And it says how many millions of hits. I think one TikTok alone got 40 million hits. It just went mm-hmm. crazy. Viral, yeah. BBC even went to uh, contact and went to Boston and interviewed our sisters. And they did two programs on the, the whole TikTok phenomenon and nuns, but they were really interested because ours were the numbers were so huge. But so that's influence. It's all influence that's going on. It's mm-hmm. also, you know, all media are pretty much an emotional medium. So it's also asking us to deal with, you know, our own humanity. In your media literacy classes that you teach, do you ever talk about how to like I think this month or next month it's going to be liter. I know we have media literacy week in October, but right. next month is going to be news literacy, which I think is super important with fake news floating around. Katrina and I talk about this all the time. Is there ways that you teach to deal with that so that you can filter what's coming at you as news, quote unquote, to see what might be real and what is just like triggering your horrible impulses? Right. So. One of the things uh, that we suggest is to check to see if the story's out there in at least three reputable places, especially now this whole thing with COVID and Omicron and all that. Well, which sources do you go to? I personally, I have the New York Times, I have NPR um, and CNN. I think those are the three places that I just go to, but who's got time to to do all that? But if you're reading something that really upsets you or that you want to, your inclination is to just share it, you know, check and see if it's accurate and at least up there three in three different places. When I was writing, um, I wrote a biography of the actor Martin Sheen, and I wrote a book about a former nun who was a great artist, Corita Kent. And the when I was working with the editor, I said, so, you know, what if this, I'm finding this information all over the internet, you know, how many sources do I need to put? And he said to me, if you find the same information in three different places online, 
reputably. Mm -hmm. He said, you have to check them out. But he said, you then it's, it's considered public information and you don't need to footnote it. Great. So oh, that kind of has given me the same guide towards news. It's like oh, check God. at least three different places before you throw a burning stick into Facebook or something. I agree. That, I, that's that so helpful. Excellent advice. And, and, and I've made a mistake. I've mistaked that. I've made mistakes myself and I've had to take things down and I've had to correct them. And I think you have to be willing to do that too. Absolutely. You know what? That's so true. You know, I just wish more people could just say, hey, you know what? I was wrong there. I, I did, you know, I, because it is really important and we don't always know. And sometimes we're reading something that really scares us. Oh my gosh, I'm going to share this with someone. I'm going to send it on my group text. And then you realize, oh, that wasn't real. So, you know, yeah, you can just say, oops, I got, I got duped there. Cause we're all going to get that, you know, that is going to happen to everyone at some point. So I love that helpful three reputable sources. That's excellent. And somebody um, might say, well, what's reputable? I, I don't watch CNN. I don't. <laughs> right? Well, I mean, that is also subjective for some people, you know, and we all have. So our, what's, I, what's reputable? I mean, I think the, how, what is their what is their track record of correcting mistakes? And you know that NPR corrects mistakes. You know, the New York Times corrects mistakes. And I think I've seen on CNN's websites where they update information and corrected you know, uh, wrong information. So if they're willing to do that, I think, I think you. So your new source and the people, your new source and the people you date should always be able to admit that they're wrong. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think that's that's a good both. <laughs> exactly. Okay. We, I, I don't, I'm not really on the dating scene myself, but okay. I'm just saying we have okay. kids, we have young kids who are in that scene. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, Kids, well, if you're watching. <laughs> the BBC is another good to, to look at how another country looks at us, even if they're an ally, quote. It's very interesting sometimes. Mm -hmm. So if we can take just a quick turn here, I was wondering, Katrina and I, we were talking yeah. about our conversation today, that people might say, well, I'll just ask you this, your review, for example, uh, about the Netflix series Coming Out Colton. Oh, right. And for, Right. And for those who don't know, uh, Colton was, a, I think, an ex-football player, wasn't he? Yes. Or, and yeah. He was on the mm -hmm. Yeah. And he was on The Bachelor. And then it turns out he was gay. Well, your review. So your review seems to demonstrate a kind of not only tolerance, but acceptance of the LGBTQ community saying, I think you were indicating everyone's love by God. But how do you reconcile issues like that? with your Catholic faith, is there any sort of disconnect there? The thing is, is that acceptance and respect and tolerance for every human being, regardless of anything, is my Catholic faith, is Christianity. Now, yes, there are questions of the moral, moral aspects of it and all that. And okay, you know, it's not an activity I engage in, but I would put forth to you here or suggest here that members of the LGBTQ community don't choose it. They don't choose who they are. And God made them. And who am I to cast them off or send them to the margins? I want to go to those margins and, and be with them. In fact, I'm preparing a feature article for St. Anthony Messenger now, and I'm doing some interviews. I'm looking at some films, uh, you know, dealing with the whole conversion therapy thing and also uh, other people's stories. And we at the St. Anthony Messenger want to do, we, we want to help parents navigate their way through their child's revelation that they are either searching for or questioning their identity or they have come out as an LGBTQ person. And I have a very close family member who is transgender, and this is the very first time I am saying this publicly. And it, when a family member, a close family member comes out, it changes your perspective on compassion. If you love that your family and you do, then yes. It's been about eight years now. It's made me much more accepting and not judgmental, but also seeking more information. And the more I see that people don't choose who they are, they just who they are. But then when I look at people, that's not what I think of. When I look at a person, I look at the person, you know, just your face, who you are. 
I want to know you. I, you know, I want to, you know, maybe be friends or work together. What your sexual identity is, is not the first thing that comes to mind for me. But, but does that, but does the Catholic church have a stance that's opposite of what you believe? Well, if you go by Pope Francis, what I just articulated to you, this idea of acceptance of respect for every person mm -hmm. and acceptance of the persons is the stance of the Catholic church. Yes, there is moral teaching, but sometimes it's articulated very harshly, like something is intrinsically wrong with the person. Maybe they didn't choose it, but it's intrinsically wrong. That's very harsh. And I think there's going to be a reformulation of that. As far as my relationship with LGBTQ people, I want to love everyone and just like Jesus would. Did you see the, the musical Rent? Yes. Remember Jonathan Larson. Yeah. Right. Right. And, but do you remember when everybody gets on the tables and they're all dancing? Uh-huh. That, that, that scene was so amazing to me. And in my mind's eye, I could see Jesus sitting there I and just it. looking around at all these different people joyously dancing, whoever they were, you know, mm -hmm. and I and said, I picture him singing the tenor part of Love Be Bohem, I think. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Please continue. But, Sorry. But that's, but that's that to me, just it just spoke to me. And I just said, you know, I have to leave a lot of things to God because I'm not God. Right. Mm -hmm. So in my work and what I do, it's compassion, respect. I love it. Thank you, Sister Rose. That is you know, a lot of what we're trying to do here at Crazy Amazing Humans is do the same and bring positivity and good media out there. And we kind of like this because when I first heard about you, Sister Rose, I got to know you because you reviewed Ken's film, but also he is the producer here for Crazy Amazing Humans. So I want to pop him in to say hello. <laughs> hello. hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> he told us, you know, you know, Katrina, people refer to Sister Rose as the badass nun. <laughs> so I was. That so is the way that I was introduced to you by Bonnie Abanza. And, I, <laughs> and being a preacher's kid, I thought, wow, that's, you know, pretty audacious. But then when I got to know you, I Bonnie. realized that, <laughs> that you are a bodacious warrior for God's word and God's love. And why not be badass? <laughs> While you you're are. doing it. <laughs> While you're doing it. That's great. So well, what, what, I'll yeah, take what do that you think a, about that? <laughs> take it as, take a, that as a huge compliment. compliment. It is. It is a compliment, yeah. of course. <laughs> so the way that you know that you approach LGBTQ and all of that is sort of one of those things where you're stepping out of the a little, you know, you're 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 stepping into what Jesus said and and what I do in as well believe, but you are stepping out. So what does it mean to you regards how you live? Well, I think we have to have the strength of our convictions, right? And the older I get, I, I think I get maybe more <laughs> bolder. Yes. But hopefully Go in a sister. good way. And you know, Pope Francis has been such a model for reaching out to the margins, to the periphery, as he says, to people where people are on the margins. And so when I see films or TV series or streaming series that really speak to the people on the margins or issues that are on the margins. I really want to review those. I want to talk about them and I hope to spark conversations among other people so that they can change their glasses or their lenses maybe a little bit and see humanity in a more positive light than maybe they had before. Because people are capable of change and people are capable of such good. And that's what I want to emphasize, even while naming the darkness, because sometimes you really have to do that. You know, one of the things we wanted to ask you about, thank you for that, by the yeah, way. Yeah, thank you. Considering how you really try to embrace a broader perspective uh, and to use, you know, media parlance, you're not a caricature of a nun. You're a whole human being integrating mm -hmm. your faith and your perspectives. So because you've kind of broadened your perspectives, it's not as narrow as some might imagine. We know, for example, that you hosted in 2016 a series of classic films that were condemned by the National Legion of Decency. And that was on what Turner Classic Movies, I believe. Right. And so that's the Hayes Code, if anyone wants to geek out on that and go check that out. So obviously, I'm going to guess that the Hayes Code is outdated, and, and that's why you did that series. But is there 
do you believe that there is a justifiable censorship line? And if yes, when should that apply? Well, interestingly enough, the Catholic Church has teachings on pornography and pornography and violence. And they, these documents have been out, I think, since the 80s. And they even, they distinguish between hard pornography and soft pornography. One, which is, you know, I'll know what porn is, you know, it's the sexual act just right there filmed for everybody to see. Or soft porn is the imitation of it. And that's, I think, where the Catholic, uh, even the Catholic reviews that come out from the Bishop's Conference today, or from the Catholic, uh, it's called Catholic News Service, but it's under the Bishop's Conference, they draw the line, you know, and, and, and actually, so do I. I, I don't want to see that. I'm, I watch TV with my sister sometimes, and, and we were watching something, and she, she's got the remote, and she goes, I don't need to see this, and so Fast forward, you know, it, it doesn't really contribute anything. And to get back to the line over which you won't go, I go to R-rated movies. R-rated movies are the better movies. There's more drama and sometimes there's more sex, but that's not what I'm saying. R doesn't mean bad. R means restricted to people 17 and older because the themes or even what's the content is really aimed at adults. It's not our more mature people. The themes are mature. You take uh, Hacksaw Ridge, you can't show that to a kid, The Passion of the Christ. You know, that had an R rating and it, it deserved it. It was really mm -hmm. hard. How does a little kid take that in and make mm -hmm. sense of it? Mm -hmm. So the ratings, whether from the M MPAA that um, replaced the Hays Code or the Catholic uh, Church's rate systems of ratings that kind of replace the legion of decency they really want to offer guidance for good choices and then once you choose and watch how you understand that's what they want to take us to that point of understanding the meaning of what we're watching and you know what if you see a film and you and you don't like it you know check it out first next time you go to watch that filmmaker or that you know story in fact everybody should do a little research before they watch a film or a tv series it's only it's only wise. How do you want to spend your time? Really? Right. Mm -hmm. And you actually, you actually wrote a must see list for, for movies. You have a list. And, and I, I was looking at it the other day and one of my favorite films is on it. It's the Shawshank Redemption. Oh, wow. And yeah, it's, it's a great one. I was just wondering, I'd love to hear what your analysis of that film is and why it's on your list. It's the humanity of that movie in the face of such inhumanity. It's probably still the top film on college campuses. And it's because of the friendship between the men, uh -huh. the, the friendship yeah. over the years. And, you know, friendship means an awful lot to young people. But as I, if I analyze it as a story, it's, it's a perfect, I mean, it's a perfectly crafted story, mm -hmm. you know, from Stephen King. And it's a, the worst nightmare, isn't it? To be <laughs> sent to prison for something that you would do. And, and you know what I love, can I just ask you uh, just a button on that uh, Katrina's question. So do you, do, would you say that because you had alluded to the fact that you have to experience some darkness for something to feel authentic, certainly a Shawshank Redemption goes dark, but then it redeems itself. Is that correct? It, well, it certainly does. And it couldn't be darker. It's really, it is dark and, and it's got so much inhumanity in it, mm -hmm. even among the prisoners themselves who are suffering. Oh, mm -hmm. That film just, it takes you through every emotion. Remember the library scene when he starts playing the beautiful music over the speakers and that's when he ends up in solitary confinement. But he, he knew that was gonna be the end of the library for him and he did it anyway. Because for the men, he did that for the men. That, you know, that whole idea of beauty, truth and goodness, that film is filled with beauty, truth and goodness. But to go back to Flannery O'Connor, you know, sometimes we can only see the light by seeing the darkness, mm -hmm. right? It's true. What are the main goals that you have when you are reviewing a film or really any media for that matter? What is your main goal? What has become my main goal is what we call Catholic social teaching or principles or themes of Catholic social teaching. And the, the main highlights, the lens through which I analyze 
is going to be human dignity and the common good. These are the top two. You know, is is there a sense of community? Is there a sense of family? What does it say about uh, the right to work? It, you know, there's so many films that deal with these issues. Participation in community and in society. Is this a story about selfishness or is this a story about giving? Sometimes it's both. Sometimes it's a journey from one to the next. Care for the earth is another very big one. And you will see that theme come through in, in major motion pictures often. You will see them become themes. You know, well, you know how long it takes for a movie to come out, right, Ken? You know, <laughs> be developed and it, it takes years. And, you know, things don't happen. Sometimes they happen quickly, but most of the time it takes two or three years to tell a story. So the movies only make sense within the context in which the, into the world in which they come. You know, sometimes we can get away with general themes, but sometimes when it's a specific theme, it'll, it makes much more sense if it's a, if it's current, at least within the last four or five years. So do you have an Academy Award nominated film that you liked in this past year? Something that you, that stands out to you? Belfast is one. I've got a few. That's a good one. If the tender bar gets nominated, I, I would go for that. Coda, Children of Deaf Adults. That was great. That was amazing. That was a great movie. I saw The Power of the Dog and I understand why everybody's gaga about it. But here's, here's what I say. Would I watch it again? Right. You know? And if it's, I want, I would like a film to win that I would watch again. So I would watch Belfast again. I would watch Coda again. I would watch uh, The Tender Bar again. I would use these in film retreats. You know, they're that good. Now, The Power of the Dog is, as my sister would say, you know, that's really not a feel-good movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they can't all be, but it is interesting. And I, it was sort of like you're confused three quarters of the time, and then you start figuring it out. You know what, Sister Rose, what I love about your answer, too, is that a lot of times an Academy Award film is going to win because it's kind of like precious or special. People seem to think like, I don't, I don't know if I would watch The Deer Hunter again, for example. I might, but I think those are two different uh, ways of looking at movies, don't you think? Like, it, to win an Academy Award, there's all these little boxes that seem to get checked, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the movie you want to keep watching over and over and over. That's I true. Love, I love the distinction that you made. Uh -huh. I think that's really yeah, helpful. That's really unique. Yeah. I think The Power of the Dog is art. I think it is. It's very artsy, mm -hmm. you know, and it's so well crafted I mean, there's so many good things about yeah. it but but it's it's dark you know it, oh, it's yeah. human but it's it's dark yeah it's like watching yellowstone in two hours <laughs> that's amazing you you've you've just seen it all i, I like it you you definitely are far beyond my uh watch you've so watched a lot. i belong to this group on facebook called binge addicts <laughs> it's you it's mentioned that in your interview with bonnie yeah uh, what and that's yes that's very intriguing you know it's a very good group because what they see something and they say oh i just watched this and it's really good now they might say why or they might just leave it at that but they one of the rules is that, that you have to put where the person where you can find it <laughs> because otherwise the moderator removes your post and people go why did my post get removed you know because you didn't put you didn't tell people where to find it but i find it very respectful of people's you know viewpoints and so people share what they've seen and and then you kind of get new ideas from that yeah Oh, that's really mm -hmm. interesting. And so, well, it's it's been so great to hear everything you have to say about media and how you participate in it from your perspective. And if people are interested in finding out more about media literacy in general or are interested in following you specifically and your comments and reviews, how could they do that? They can follow me on Facebook or on Twitter because I always post links to my reviews on either one of those places. Be Media Mindful has my reviews and the reviews of some of our other sisters. Be Media Mindful.org, uh, Sister Rose Reviews.net. That's my, re my reviews on the National Catholic Reporter. And sometimes book reviews are included there too. So, one more way to do media literacy the media mindfulness four questions what's going on? What's really going on? Does it make a difference? How can I make a difference? Like and then the THINK acronym is another framework to use for uh, becoming media literate and engaging in media and questioning the media. Always question it. 
And that is T, is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? And most of all, is it kind? So that's a guide for creation, for consumption, for making meaning. Wow. That sounds a, really good. Yeah. What a great guide. What a great uh -huh. guide. So, That's an excellent right. guide. So Sister Rose, thank you so much. And I think, uh, see what I did there? <laughs> not, not only are you badass. You are a crazy, amazing human. And it's been so much fun and inspiring to be with you and hear your perspective. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I want you. Wow, a big thank you to Sister Rose Picotti for being with us today. Thanks, Sister Rose. It is really true that the media we consume affects us and how being aware of its impact through media literacy helps us all be more intentional in our media choices. If you've enjoyed today's episode and you think it would be meaningful and helpful for someone you know, be a crazy, amazing human and let them know about us. Right. A couple of quick reminders. Make sure to subscribe to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We've also filmed the podcasts, so you can check us out on the Crazy Amazing Humans YouTube channel. Make sure and leave comments. We love to hear what you're thinking. This is true. And most of all, we want to make sure to thank you for being with us. Thank you. And remember that every little kindness has the potential to create crazy, amazing human experience one person at a time. And as always, this week, we want to encourage you to find one thing that you can do to extend kindness and love in the world. I'm Jefferson Denham. And I'm Katrina Carlson. Stay healthy, stay connected, and we'll see you next time right here on the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast. I want you to feel, I want you to feel something crazy, crazy amazing. If you have any questions or comments about today's episode, please make sure to write us at crazyamazinghumans at gmail.com.